One of the more recent excitements found in the UFC fandom since the start of the social media age is the big fight announcements. It's instant, sometimes it's in video form with Dana screaming, and everybody gets to react in real time. And while often we're all losing our minds with how awesome a fight is that just got announced, every once in a while the UFC will throw one at us that enrages everybody. Matchups that make no sense and that are immediately rejected. Just a whole fandom throwing digital tomatoes at the UFC social team. And today we're gonna look at the ones that had us the most fired up. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, a massive thank you to our channel Hall of Famers who helped make videos like this possible, and these are 10 UFC fight announcements that made fans furious. Number 10, Hamza Chimaev versus Nate Diaz. This is the perfect fight to start with because I get to throw in the caveat that we're not going to be doing fights where some poor old vet gets owned on the prelims by some new freak who just got into the promotion. We're only talking headliners here, the big fights that matter, but the old being fed to the young does piss fans hands off. And this one is the closest to that on this list, because what was the UFC thinking? I mean, this is your goodbye to Nate after the final fight on his contract? This is your thank you for being one of the biggest stars of the last six years? Here's some fucking undefeated 28-year-old murder machine Swedish wrestling champion middleweight posing as a welterweight who's just gonna ragdoll your ass all over the octagon? I have absolutely no idea what the UFC was thinking here. It's not like they were on bad terms with Diaz. Dana was talking about how this is his house and all that stuff after the fight. I'm sure as soon as he gets a boxing match or two in, he's going to be back in the UFC. So this wasn't the old being fed to the young because we see no value in you anymore. It made no sense and everybody hated it. Luckily, Hamza wouldn't even try to make weight, forcing the UFC to rearrange the card and give Nate a proper send-off headliner against Tony Ferguson, who also deserved one last spot at the top. You guys already know what it is. Real G's come from California, America, motherfucker. This worked out perfectly somehow, but it certainly didn't by design, and fans were not happy initially. Number 9, Korean Zombie vs. Max Holloway. My blood was boiling when this one was announced. Like, you're gonna put TKZ against the guy who punched Calvin Cater 447 times in the face right after you threw him in there with God King Volk, who absolutely battered him. It just felt like an obviously bad outcome. I didn't understand the matchmaking at all. Everybody loves Zombie, and nobody wanted to see him get demolished again if there was just no reason for it, and it really felt like there was no reason here. But then we found out that Jung had specifically requested the fight for his retirement bout, which was to headline a card in Singapore. Once I knew that, I was willing to accept that this was what TKZ wanted, even though I still felt like it was a bad idea, but the apprehension went away. That was until they got into the octagon, and then I was worried all over again. Luckily though, I was entirely wrong. While Zombie would get KO'd, it was honestly the perfect send-off, and one of the best retirements the sport has ever had. So I gotta say, everybody involved nailed this one, but man, yeah. That first announcement had a lot of us saying, are you trying to get this man killed? Number eight, Israel Adesanya versus Yoel Romero. Usually when you win fights, that progresses your career. If you lose fights, that is generally going to negatively affect your chances at fighting for championships. But sometimes the UFC just doesn't give a single shit about that. And one of those times was when they randomly gave Yoel Romero a middleweight title shot after two losses in a row. One loss, I might add, in which he missed weight, making it a non-title bout. This came after a different title bout in which he again missed weight. So you got a guy on a two fight losing streak who in the last two title fights you awarded him, he missed weight, nullifying the championship aspect of the bout. But that's the guy who should fight Israel Adesanya next. Sure, that makes perfect sense. I'm sure nobody is going to be pissed about that. Even more ridiculously, the last guy who beat Romero, Paulo Costa, who was ranked higher than him, still hadn't yet received his title challenge. Apparently the bout was made because Izzy wanted the fight. And okay, you know what? It doesn't make sense but you know it's gonna be a banger. Oh wait, no, it's one of the worst title fights of all time? That's a shame. Hilariously enough, Izzy finds himself on the other side of this equation in another unpopular upcoming bout, at least unofficially, when he'll be coming off his title loss to take on Drickus Duplessis for the middleweight championship. Number seven, Anthony Pettis versus Max Holloway. This is one of the most convoluted messes of a moment the UFC has ever had. The fight itself, Pettis versus Holloway, nothing really wrong with that. Max was on a big time win streak, a former champ in Pettis had just moved to 145 and got a surprising submission victory over Du Bronx. The issue was that it was for the interim featherweight title, an interim title that was currently being held by Jose Aldo, who earned it after defeating Frankie Edgar at UFC 200 since divisional champ Conor McGregor was
was busy fighting welterweight Nate Diaz. It made absolutely no sense. How are we going to have two interim champions? Well, we're not because two weeks before the fight, McGregor was stripped and Aldo was upgraded to undisputed, even though it would be in dispute again for no reason two weeks later. There was of course a reason though, the UFC had a pay-per-view fall apart at the last second and desperately needed there to be some kind of gold on the line so people would pay money to watch the event. One of the most pointless titles that's ever been awarded. Number six, Valentina Shevchenko versus Sajara Eubanks. One of the biggest accomplishments the UFC has ever had was spearheading the effort to finally get MMA legalized in New York. And they celebrated that victory with a massive UFC 205 card headlined by Conor McGregor at the Mecca of Combat Sports, Madison Square Garden. A year later, they would return to MSG for arguably the greatest card in the history of the promotion, UFC 217, headlined by the return of George St. Pierre. So a pattern was emerging. Every November, the UFC was going to be heading to Madison Square Garden, and they were going to be putting on a mega card. A month before the third annual event, the UFC had strangely not yet announced who would be at the top of the next MSG show at UFC 230. But you know, they always do insane cards there, so it's gonna be some massive names. Oh my god, it's Fedor, right? They got Fedor versus Lesnar. Holy shit, guys. Just kidding, it's Valentina Shevchenko versus Sajari Eubanks for the vacant flyweight title. Yay! Look, it wasn't a bad fight in theory. It just wasn't the New York card headliner type fight everybody was expecting. And this was the saving bout, by the way. Valentina was supposed to fight Ioana Violence at the next pay-per-view, so they pulled her off that to make this the headliner because they had absolutely nothing. A week later, they just said, fuck this fight. Valentina, you are back against Ioana because Daniel Cormier agreed to fight Derek Lewis to save this event. If you can call that fight saving it. What a mess. Number five, Colby Covington versus Leon Edwards. Let's be 100% honest here. There are lots of nerds and virgins out there who are going to get mad anytime Colby is announced to fight at all because they can't handle that he spoiled The Force Awakens. Well, too bad, geeks, because he's getting a third title challenge in five fights coming off a win against Jorge Masvidal nearly two years earlier. Wait, what the fuck? Okay, even if you were a Colby fan, surely the reasonable side of you could understand why this one didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people when it was announced. Sure, Colby was a name. He had that value. It's just as a contender, this one made zero sense. After losing the second time to Usman, another controversial title challenge because he was coming off a victory over late stage Tyron Woodley, Colby would finally have his big beef fight with Jorge Masvidal. But by that time, Gamebred had lost back-to-back -back bouts with Usman himself, the second of which many fans were upset about for the same reasons as this one. A lot of nonsense happening at 170. Anyway, the victory over Masvidal didn't exactly feel like something that was title worthy. Not to mention that was nearly two years earlier. Bilal Muhammad was on a 10 fight win streak at that point. He'd won three fights since Covington had even stepped into the cage. Now, don't get me wrong, between the contingent of fans who don't like Bilal and that will cheer for Colby no matter what, there were plenty of people loving this matchup and willing to justify it in their heads, but quite a vocal bit of the social media bubble felt like this was a gift wrapped title shot for Covington because of his popularity and nothing else. Number four, Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. When this light heavyweight title fight was announced as the headliner of UFC 300, there was quite a bit of unrest and criticism levied at the UFC over it being given top billing. Why, you ask? Well, if you open your official UFC textbooks, the MMA experts weighed in on what they thought of UFC 300. And for all the fighters that were on this card, when I said this is the greatest card ever assembled in the history of combat sports, this is what the media thought of you guys. It's because the media is the enemy of the people and don't know shit about anything because what have they ever done in their lives except lie about people who actually do shit? If you ask a few other people though, Sounds like I something a nerd or a virgin would do. It was because Dana White in particular had been telling fans that UFC 300's headliner was gonna make them believe in God. People have such high expectations for 300 because you set them. The first prelim of the night is going to make you go, oh my god. It's going to be a very special, unique card like nothing we've ever done before. It was going to be so good and so huge that once it was announced, you were going to unload in your pants with such force that you would fly into space. We have one more slot to fill mid-level and then we have the main event. I know what I'm trying to do, what, what, but what, what I'm trying to do and what are gonna happen there could end up being two completely different things unless I completely fucking change everything. Is there any other like super fights that you could see happening over the next like two years or year? There like is. We're talking about one right now actually that just popped up a few days ago. So I can't talk about it, but you know. You'll get the main event when I'm ready to give you the main event. You're not ready yet. You can't handle the main event. So sorry that people were disappointed when we were told this thing was going to change the way we understand 
understood our own existence, and instead... It will feature Alex Pereira defending his light heavyweight title against Jamal Hill. A week before the announcement of the bout, John Jones revealed that he was offered to headline but declined on account of still recovering from his torn pec. Hill would reveal that the offer came to him the day before the fight was officially announced. I, I got a call Friday. We want you and Alex to headline UFC 300. You had unreal expectations for something. Now, granted, I think Dana, well, did. He did overstep with some of the comments that he made. So we know that this was not the plan. We know that the UFC was trying Trying to do something else and they didn't end up getting it done. Did 300 turn out to be great? You are goddamn right. One of the best cards the UFC has ever put on. All the praise ever is deserved. Does that mean fans weren't justified for being a bit underwhelmed when Pereira versus Hill was announced after we were told we were getting Fedor versus Godzilla or some shit? No, no it doesn't. Number three, Cyril Gaon versus Derek Lewis. To explain why fans were so up in arms about this fight, we need to go back a ways to when Francis Ngannou was going to fight Stipe Miocic for the second time for the heavyweight title. With a single fight left on his contract after Stipe, the UFC attempted to negotiate a new deal with Francis, one he rejected. So once he was the champion, he was now a single fight away from completing his obligations to the promotion. The UFC then attempted to book a series of bouts from June to August with Derek Lewis, but according to the champ, without proper time to prepare and a visa issue that kept him from training in the US with his team, he was forced to decline. He said they then offered him a fight in September that he accepted. But Five days later, the UFC announced Gon versus Lewis for the interim title in August. It just made absolutely no sense, besides, of course, the usual, the UFC needing some kind of headliner with gold on the line. But with the champ willing and ready to go a month later, this one had fans completely baffled, especially because it almost felt like it was being done just because Ngannou was being difficult about his contract. Gon would win, and he and Ngannou would fight in October to unify the belt after one of the most needless interim title bouts that has ever been put together. Number two, Michael Bisping versus Dan Henderson too. You know, for a lot of these entries, it really is like, what the hell were they thinking? But not this one. This one was very simple. It just didn't make any damn sense whatsoever. Bisping winning the title against Luke Rockhold was one of the all time great holy shit upset moments the sport has ever produced. But the goodwill generated by that victory would last as long as it took the UFC to announce that his first title defense would be against Dan Henderson. Here was the problem. Days before this announcement, Yoel Romero had decimated Chris Weidman and then very awesomely called Bisping out. Oh, perfect. The new number one ranked guy just called the champion out. They were talking shit to each other. What a great fight that I can't wait to happen. What an obvious fight. Nope, number 13, Dan Henderson. And I get it, it looks good on a poster, this being the rematch of their classic UFC 100 bout. Henderson is a name, but that was it. It made no sense otherwise, and fans were pissed. And even though the fight turned out to be a really good one, it still felt like one of the most shoehorned main events the UFC had ever put together in the face of such an obvious number one contender too. Number one, John Jones versus Stipe Miocic. You can call it recency bias if you want, but this one has kept people angry for so damn long now, spanning two potential fights, I don't know how I couldn't put it at number one. It was early September of last year when the UFC announced one of the least popular fights in some time between JBJ and Stipe for the heavyweight title. Now, without context, what is wrong with that fight? They are two of the best to ever do it finally throwing down. Jones captured the title earlier that year, in his big comeback fight after three years off. Miocic's last bout was two and a half years earlier and he lost to champion Francis Ngannou. Okay, I'm starting to see the problem here. Yeah, so it wasn't just the long layoff for Stipe, who I do feel gets undue hate in this situation. Like, are you gonna turn down a John Jones title fight? Come on. The real point of contention was there was this guy called Sergei Pavlovich who was eating the heavyweight division alive and everybody felt like he should be fighting for the belt. But the UFC didn't give a shit and UFC 295 was set for Jones versus Miocic. That was until Johnny tore his pec in training and the fight was replaced on the card with Pavlovich versus Tom Aspinall for interim gold. The Englishman got a KO in a minute and everybody was jacked to see him fight John Jones. But guess what? He's never, ever, ever gonna fight him ever. Jones and the UFC have been adamant that Stipe is the fight and that is final. They are not budging, even though as of this writing, there's no official date on that 
one. And it's been so long, poor Tom's had to have an interim title defense in the meantime. Ironically enough, 511 days since John last fought. The exact number of days before the UFC stripped Conor McGregor of the lightweight title. You can't make this stuff up. I'll tell you who does have the guts to fight Tom Aspinall, though. The editor of this video, Luke Taylor. Be sure to follow him on all his social media, go check out his awesome YouTube channel, and let Tom know he's down for that fight. Right here, the hardest hitting 145 pound, the real hardest hitting 145 are right here. When I knock people out, they don't fucking move. Another huge shout out to our channel hall of famers. Such an awesome little community we got there. If you do join, there's all kinds of exclusive content, and you might even have some say in our videos. Like and subscribe to prevent Colby Covington from getting another title shot. Comment down below which of these fight announcements got you fired up the most. And thank you so much for watching, you guys. I'll catch you later.